Resisting the woke war on the world. We are involved in a world war, and it's a woke world war, and it's actually a war against the world. It's also known as cancel culture. Cancel culture is the woke war on the world. This cartoon here sort of sums it up quite well. A BLM, or Baal, Lucifer and Murder, or Bolshevik Lives Matter, um, they came on the scene in 2020, and the whole concept of woke um, came into the mainstream as we started to see companies, corporations falling over themselves to give millions and tens of millions of dollars to a group that was burning down whole cities, burning down police precincts, um, burning, destroying, causing immense havoc. And the amount of churches that fell over themselves to identify with it and even started to put up that banner as well. Just recently, it's been proven they haven't done one single thing to help any black people anyway. It's meant to be a charity, a non-profit, and all they've done is build, build and buy lavish multi-million dollar homes for themselves, burn and destroy a lot of things, and interestingly, one of the founders or leaders of the BLM movement came on TV recently and said, well, BLM achieved its objective. Its primary goal was to advance the transgender agenda into mainstream news. And that's a bit puzzling to us because we didn't think it was there to advance the transgender movement, but there in its own website, that's what BLM claimed one of its main goals was, to destroy the nuclear family and to advance the transgender community's rights, which is amazing. At any rate, that's just part of corporate cancel culture. They literally, they cancelled shopping centres, police stations, businesses, buildings, all sorts of things. They certainly burned and blew up a lot of things. Now, the transgender movement is a general umbrella term to cover everything from transsexual, gender benders, gender blenders, gender outlaws, androgynous, drag queens, cross-dressers, third genders, and whatever else there is out there, gender queers. Now, there's a lot that you can learn from the recent backlash by consumers leading to catastrophic declines in income for Target. Target's one of the largest chain stores in America, which recently, in just one week, lost more than $9 billion, that's billion with a B, in corporate value on the stock exchange in one week after pulling out a ultra-pride selection of clothing, not just for children, but even for babies and for pets, by the way. So one person put this here, Target is going off to little kids about sexual orientation, it's pretty low. Take pride, you're adding to the confusion, boycott Target, leave kids alone. And along with that was Bud Light. Not that I'm into beer, but this apparently is a very popular brand, and they got some transgender man pretending to be a woman dressed up in a kind of Audrey Hepburn type dress with Audrey Hepburn type pearls, and promoting Bud Light, and they're facing such a boycott after alienated customers uh, started staying away from them in droves. They were reduced to offering crates of beer, first of all with massive discounts, then for free, crates of beer for free, and the customers still weren't interested. And now they're literally being offered free, but the customers are not interested in Bud Light. Some people have posted online a whole parking lot filled with Bud Light crates and a steamer just going over and destroying them all systematically. Another person put a triangle of Bud Lights and machine guns um, and filmed that being done to send a message to the company. Not very good when you alienate your primary support base. Now apparently Bud Light's such a joke that people will be, you know, in bars saying, um, you know, so-and-so, you know, one of our people, he's going to take a Bud Light, and of course he'll be denying it. It's like, you know, you insulting a person to suggest he drinks Bud Light now, that sort of thing. As for Disney World, since Disney World's provoked such a backlash against their woke policies, they've been repeatedly inserting LGBTQ plus <laughs> themes and radical political agenda in their increasingly failing series of films and events, even the resorts are being boycotted now. They have gay pride days and weeks at the resort. Now, this is meant to be a family-friendly entertainment center. So Disney, which was once the most successful family entertainment producer, and now has had to lay up off more than 7,500 workers this year so far. They picked a fight with the governor of Florida, 
Ron DeSantis by going off to him and his administration when they introduced laws to protect children from being groomed with sexually orientated material uh, from grade five below. I mean, grade five, that's not particularly um, very old anyway. And they acted like this was the biggest attack on American liberties in history. And Disney went to war against the voters and legislators of uh, Florida. So Florida rescinded their independence status. Disney World's been operating like an independent country. It didn't have to pay the same taxes. They could, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> literally control <coughs> their whole their own area with their own police force and municipalities. They did their own roads department. They were running like an independent country. So now they've had that um, taken away. And they've got to submit to the same rules everyone else has to in the state of Florida. This sort of gives you a bit of an idea. You've got your trance station and uh, the vaccinated only. Take your snow white privilege and get out of here. Black lives matter horn. Socialism go around. Um, free ride. And that is... Um, Antifa land, there we go. Um, this is the way many people are seeing Disney World's becoming. Wokeness is ruining Disney World. I mean, most people were going to Disneyland not because they wanted trans politics forced down their throats, but because they thought it was family friendly, which was what Disney's vision and dream. Exodus 23 verse 2 says, You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. And I think wokeness is really following the crowd. It is... Bam! All the sheep sort of following the herd. Mm. And so Disney stocks are plummeting. Absolutely disastrous. In one week, these three woke companies have lost over 28 billion. Target, Bud Light and Disney. More than 28 billion in a week. That's pretty disastrous. You think how long it must have taken to build up that stock and how short a time it is to destroy it. Go work, go broke. On a stock exchange, these woke companies are losing, they cratering their values. And then Nike employed a transgender man to model women's sportswear. He discovered those who go woke go broke, and this imbecile prancing around uh, so um, incensed women to think they can be depicted this way. I mean, imagine you're trying to win women customers to buy women's sportswear, and you have a man posing in it acting like a fool and giving the impression, well, this is what women are like. And no wonder Nike is going broke. The LGBT agenda is at the very heart and soul of Biden's policies. The Democrat Party is completely lockstep with the rainbow LGBTQ perverts agenda. There's an excellent video in our library downstairs called Gay Rights Special Rights by the... Um, by Pat Matriciano, and one of the pictures in there is of this man saying, I'm gay and I teach America's children. This is one of the most disturbing things is the amount of teachers are woke and are either cramming critical race theory or the LGBT perversion agenda down children's throats. Some people discover this only during lockdown when they start to see what their children are actually being taught. Now, President Vladimir Putin recently observed that Russia's already been there. They know all about this. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 introduced cancel culture, radical cancel culture. They destroyed monuments, they removed teachers, they removed professors and pastors, they renamed streets and buildings. They tried to cancel the culture of thousands of years in Russia. That was it. They started like the year zero, new culture, new everything. They had to cancel the old culture, including Christianity, to make space for the new Bolshevik gods. As a preparation for political and cultural revolution, they first cancel a culture, next thing is they cancel a people. People who cancel your culture and your history, and your religion, are soon going to come out with exterminating you as well, which is what the Soviets did. Interesting that it took Vladimir Lenin to point this, sorry, Vladimir Putin to point it out to us today, that the Soviet Union waged war against history, Christianity, and against the family. So they know all about cancel culture in Russia. They've been there already. And the Soviet Union also distorted gender roles and they conscripted women to the Red Army. And they put 
women in the front line in a battle. Ultimately, cancel culture is a war against Christian civilization. It's a war against God himself. Not just against Christian civilization, but against God. Cancel culture is actually antichrist. At its core, you can see they're not out there to cancel pornography. They're not out there to cancel Hinduism or Buddhism. They're out there to cancel Christianity, basically. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. A recent tweet by the top spy in Britain alleges that LGBTQ issues are at the heart of the war in Ukraine. This is Richard Moore, chief of MR6. He tweeted on the 25th of February this uh, last year, We should remember the values and hard-won freedoms that distinguish us from Putin, none more so than LGBTQ rights. Now, if you were to write the speech, what distinguishes us from Putin? What is it that we're fighting for? What's at the core of our values? If you're in Britain, what might you say? Democracy, freedom, Christianity, Western civilization. What would you choose? Well, he said LGBTQ rights are at the core of our values. That's what distinguishes us from the enemy. Well, interesting, because the Russian Orthodox Patriarch, Kirill, declared that the West essentially organizes genocidal campaigns against countries that refuse to stage gay pride parades. And he pointed out Libya, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, they're targeting countries that won't have a LGBTQ, a gay pride march. They're the ones who get targeted for destruction by America. Well, we could say that's probably why they targeted South Africa and Rhodesia too back in the 70s and 80s. President Putin declared... They, that's the Soviets, sought to destroy our traditional values and force on us their fa false values that would erode us, erode our people from within. The attitudes they've been aggressively imposing on their countries, attitudes that are directly leading to degradation, degeneration, because they are contrary to Christianity. This is not going to happen. No one has ever succeeded in doing this, nor will they succeed now. What the Western countries are trying to do to the Russian Federation now is what um, the Soviets used to do with them, cancelling their culture, their heritage, their religion, everything that they stood for. And so the people in Russia know about this. They've been there before. They're not fooled. And he said, listen, I would like to point out once again that they have a right to do this. We are keeping others. But we would like to ask them to keep out of our business as well. We have a different viewpoint, at least the overwhelming majority of Russian society. It would be more correct to put it this way has a different opinion on this matter. We believe that we must rely on our own spiritual values, our historic tradition, and the culture of our multi-ethnic nation. We look on an amazement at the processes underway in the countries which have traditionally been looked at as the standard bearers of progress. Of course, the social cultural shocks that are taking place in the United States and Western Europe are none of our business. We are keeping out of this. Uh, this, by the way, is in Holland, Amsterdam, Canals. Can you imagine? I'm gay and I teach America's children. Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. Woe to those who are wise in their own sight and shrewd in their own sight. Are these woke people not incredibly intelligent in their own sight? They really think they're great. And what does America put on their flagpoles throughout this coming month, June? They're putting LGBTQ rainbow flags on every flagpole around the embassies throughout the world. Every American embassy around the world is apparently being decorated with this garbage. And, you know, what do you think people in the Middle East think about that? And if it's possible to be worse, can you believe there are so-called priests and ministers of the gospel marching in these gay pride marches? The wokeness is not just in society, it's not just in American embassies, it's now in churches and seminaries, theological cemeteries are full of it. And now you get women ministers with tattoos who are self-confessed lesbians and so on. And honestly, how can you have people like this as leaders in a church? Well, this is a more honest t-shirt. Be gay, hail Satan. With the pentagram and rainbow sunglasses and the goat's head. Be gay, hail Satan. At its core... The LGBTQ agenda is antichrist. It is satanic because it 
ignores the Bible, it violates the laws of God, it rejects the family that God has set up, it rejects what God has made. God has made the male and female. Biblically, pride is a sin. Pride comes before a fall. The middle edge of pride is I, selfishness. And notice it used to be gay pride or LGBTQ pride, but now they just are simplifying it and editing it to Pride Month and Pride Marches. Well, it's not considered a good thing to be proud. And what do they have to be proud of? God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. This is repeated again and again in the Bible. It's a major theme. Pride is sin. Proverbs 21 verse 4. A high look, a proud heart, the flowing of the wicked, the plowing of the wicked is sin. Psalm 10 verse 4. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. Jeremiah 50, 31. Behold, I'm against thee, O thou most proud, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, quoting again from Vladimir Putin. Some people in the West believe that an aggressive elimination of entire pages of, from their own history, reverse discrimination against the majority in the interest of a minority, and the demand to give up na traditional notions of mother, father, family, even gender, they believe that all of these are milestones on a path towards social renewal. Well, They've been there already. The advocates of so-called social progress believe that introducing humanity some kind of new and better consciousness. Godspeed, hoist the flags, as we say. Go right ahead. The only thing I want to say now is that their prescriptions are not new at all. It may come as a surprise to some people, said Putin, but Russia has been there already. After the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks, relying on the dogmas of Marx and Lenin and Engels, also said they would change existing ways and notions and customs, and not just political and economic ones, but the very notion of human morality and the foundations of a healthy society. The destruction of age-old values, religion, and relations between people, up to and including the total rejection of family. We had that too. Encouragement to inform and loved ones. All of this was proclaimed progress, and by the way, was widely supported around the world back then, and was quite fashionable, same as today. By the way, the Bolsheviks were absolutely also intolerant of opinions other than their own. So the total intolerance of the cancel culture crowd is also copying the Bolshevik revolution. Interesting that we have someone like Vladimir Putin, who used to be a member of the Communist Party and a KGB agent, needing to remind us of all this. Very telling. Yes, we've been there before. We know about this. In fact, one of the heroes of the Soviet Union is some teenage boy they built statues of him all over because he informed on his parents who were Christians and they got executed as a result. And this boy's name became National Byword for Patriotism and pictures of him with his red scarf and his statue were put up all over Russia. And uh, he was lifted up as the ideal to children. He even informed on his own parents because of his loyalty to party. He put the party above uh, blood and, and family ties. So, yes... When it comes to, you know, taking women, putting them in the front line in battle, con uh, confusing gender roles, putting women in the factory, um, taking away the man as the provider, protector, and leader of the home, and putting the government in that place. So the transgender and ca cancel culture crowd are just following Marxism, not only in what they target and how they target it, but in how intolerant they are of anyone having an alternative viewpoint. Still quoting from Putin, this, I believe, should call to mind some of what we're witnessing now. Look at what is happening in a number of Western countries. We are amazed to see the domestic practices which we fortunately have left, I hope, in the distant past. The fight for equality and against discrimination has turned into aggressive dogmatism bordering on absurdity. When the works of great authors of the past, such as Shakespeare, are no longer taught at schools or universities because the ideas are believed to be backward, the classics are declared backward and ignorant of the importance of gender or race. Yes, they hate Jane Austen and Charles Dickens and Shakespeare because they don't have the obsession with race and gender that the modern cancel culture crowd have. So of course they're going to cancel uh, Jane Austen and Shakespeare and Charles Dickens. They must because they cut across everything they stand for. In Hollywood, memos are distributed about proper storytelling and how many characters of what color or gender should be in the movie. This is even worse in the agitprop or agitation propaganda department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Now here, Vladimir Putin is pointing out that 
Hollywood is worse now than the agitprop departments of the Soviet Union's Central Committee. And they were incredibly intolerant. So what we're getting now from Hollywood, you just look at what they give Academy Awards for. If it's perverted, if it's twisted, if it's grotesque, uh, they celebrate ugliness, not beauty. They celebrate vice, not virtue. Plato said many years ago, the price of apathy towards public affairs is to be ruled by evil men. When you're ruled by evil men, it's because most people have got apathetic about being salt and light in the society. If we are not teaching, if we're not involved in discipling the nation, if we're not salt and light in society, we mustn't complain when the society gets worse and worse. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought evil on themselves. This is a transgender demo in front of the Supreme Court in America in Washington, D.C. How do you like this person? I bet hell is fabulous. Here's a transgender cross-dresser. I bet hell is not fabulous, but... Yeah. It just shows you the mentality. Many of these people openly are being clear that they're serving Satan and they hate God and they hate the Bible. Gay pride is why Sodom got fried. Now that may sound a little intolerant to some people, a bit provocative, but it is a fact. Why would you want to be so excited about sin and why would you be proud of it? Pride comes before fall. Sodom should stand as an eternal reminder of what God thinks about such immorality. God destroyed Sodom. Here's some fireworks in honor of Pride Month. <laughs> yeah. There are some brave Christians who have demonstrations and outreaches to gay pride events, but they've got to be incredibly brave because these people are often very vile and very aggressive. If you feel like you're all alone as you take a stand for God, just remember only eight people got onto the ark and thousands of animals. Only four people fled Sodom and Gomorrah. Only David stood against Goliath. Only Elijah stood against the hundreds of prophets of Baal. Only three Hebrew children refused to bow to the idol of King Nebuchadnezzar on the plains of Dura. Only one woman anointed Jesus' feet. Only one apostle stood by the cross of Christ when the rest forsook him. So being a true Christian can get lonely, but being part of the heavenly minority is worth it all in the end. We don't want to be following the crowd. Remember, the crowd is normally wrong. Solomon, Gomorrah, and Lot's wife should be a warning for gays, LGBTQs, and their supporters and enablers. The Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire. The Lord out of heaven poured brimstone and fire. He overthrew those cities and all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. As Charles Spurgeon said, concerning homosexuality, um, homosexuality brought hell out of heaven, um, and again, you get in Genesis 19 how Lot's wife looked back longingly um, at the evil society she was fleeing from, and she was judged and became a pillar of salt. And we are commanded in Luke 17:32 to remember Lot's wife. When you put your hand to the plow, you're not meant to look backwards. Sodom and Gomorrah committed sexual immorality, practiced perversion, and they serve as an example of undergoing punishment of eternal fire. Now, Saul Alinsky wrote the book Rules for Radicals, which is the Bible of the modern left in America, and uh, Osama, um, Obama, um, Obama, Barack Hussein Obama, followed Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, as did Hillary Clinton. They both said Saul Alinsky was a mentor for them. And he spoke about the importance of being radical and said that actually, um, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement of the very first radical from our legends, mythology and history, and who it is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or where which is which. The first radical known to man who rebelled against establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom was Lucifer, who tempted um, Adam and Eve in the garden and who rebelled against God. So he's the first radical. And so we need to acknowledge the first radical. 
And the Mount of Monks is like that. Otto Scott, who wrote the book Robespierre, Inside the French Revolution, he documented how the very term of the left comes from the French Revolution, where the, the left were the cursed, the damned, the goats. Because the Lord says, you know, the sheep on my right and the goats on my left. And so he condemned the, those on his left, depart from me, cursed and lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So during the French Revolution, the radicals called themselves the left, that they're the damned, they're the goats. Uh, and so from that time, the concept of the left has been in our politics. And George Orwell, who was once a Marxist himself, and therefore understood it, wrote the book 1984, which is somewhat prophetic, describing a state where uh, big brothers watching you, omnipresent surveillance, and where thought crimes are punished. This is also well documented uh, by our friend Curtis Bowers in the film Agenda, Grinding America Down, showing the Marxist influence through education, entertainment, news media, um, all the way through the political institutions. And this is not a conspiracy theory, this is an agenda, the published agenda, which they are doing openly. Masters of Deceit, these are great videos to see. Now, the Frankfurt School of Mission, uh, or the Frankfurt School of Marxism is, in many ways, the authors of cancel culture and of the present Gramsci strategy that we've seen. At the heart of the Frankfurt School of Marxism was the breakdown of the family. Now, after the First World War, after the Bolshevik Revolution, a group of Marxists gathered in Frankfurt, Germany, and they came to the conclusion Vladimir Lenin got it lucky. We're not going to get the same correlation of forces as brought down the Tsar and brought the Bolshevik Revolution success in Russia and the rest of Europe. Europe is too Christian. We can't be hoping for a perfect storm to create the kind of conditions for a revolution in the West. What we need to do is work at cultural Marxism, internally rotting out the insides of the Western institutions. And so the Frankfurt School of Marxism, or the cultural Marxists, came up with the Gramsci strategy. Antonio Gramsci was the founder of the Italian Communist Party. And he spoke about, <coughs> let's stick with this, he spoke about the need to hollow out the pillars of Western civilization, education, entertainment, news media, religious institutions, and political institutions. Be termite strategy, like the termite working his way through a wooden pillar, and you can put fresh coat of paint on the outside, but ultimately it'll all collapse if the termites rot out the inside of the wood, the pillars. And we need to be involved in a long march of Marxism through the institutions of the West until the whole cultural edifice collapses. And the goal was to bring a collapse to the West, Western institutions, rotting out the church, the education, entertainment, news media, religious institutions. And at the core of it is to break down the family. So you can see where the transgenders and the cancel culture fits into this goal. And by the way, Antonio Gramsci was also joined by... Um, and Matus and Professor Matus's ideological contribution was we must introduce vulgarity, coarse speech and swearing into the arts, <coughs> especially plays and musicals and ultimately into cinema, which was just starting at that time. And the goal was they said we must use cursing like verbal grenades against the bourgeois to undermine the fabric of study. Get the people to celebrate ugliness and meaninglessness in the arts and the books and the musics and the films and the plays. And of course, by waging war against the family, one of the goal is that uh, at that stage, the beginning of the 20th century, the average European was having eight to ten children. In fact, President Paul Kruger's wife had 17 children. President Paul Kruger had 144 grandchildren. So to get to a stage where the average European would have next to no children, I think it's 1.2 on average now in Europe, uh, what had to happen? Well, you had to get the woman into the workplace, away from the home. And you had to force women to pay taxes. You needed two taxpayers for every home at least. So overtaxing to drive the woman into the workplace, of course wars to conscript the men and then conscript the women into factories to produce the bombs and so on that's going to blow up other people's. Uh, sons and brothers and husbands uh, on the other side. 
Um, the First World War was key to this. So the cultural Marxists also had the goal of bringing down, ultimately, uh, the amount of people who are traditionally Christian. So it was a war against the womb, a war against the West, a war against women, a war against family. Of course, abortion, LGBTQ, alternative lifestyles, sterilizations, that helps as well, euthanasia as well. But I mean, basically, bring down the number of, of Europeans and import a lot of foreign, more pliable, easier to manipulate people who can be guaranteed on for votes by buying their votes, by keeping them poor, and making sure that they depend on the state who promises them free things in exchange for their vote. And so you can see how London could become Londinistan. England uh, uh, could easily uh, be taken over. America could become Ameristan. Europe could become Eurabia, the way it's going at the moment. Because uh, even in a place like Belgium, the most common name now is Muhammad uh, of any newborns. And the way things are going in the West is the average Westerner is having very, very few children. And the average Muslim coming in, well, if they've got four wives, who knows how many children they can have. So after a while, you can get the traditional Christians outbred, outnumbered, outvoted, and out. And one of the key things in the New World Order is to get rid of the men. And so the war against men, the war against masculinity, the war against the family, um, pornography is a key part of this, and feminism, chase the men away and entice them away until they become completely slaves of sin and Satan. They won't be leaders, they won't be providers or protectors. And then the state can step in and take the place where the father had been before. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupt good character. Gay pride is why Sodom got fried. Not very intelligent to take the rainbow, which was symbolic of God's first judgment of the world through a flood, and wave it around to celebrate sin and abomination and what God calls perversity. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. 2 Chronicles 19 verse 2. Have you had the frustrating experience of trying to communicate with someone who seems triggered by the words you use into jumping to conclusions which condemn you for things which you never even thought to say? Have you become exasperated at how simple words and concepts can be so hijacked and distorted into the opposite of what you intended? Perhaps you've experienced people poisoning the well so that, despite your best intentions, your motives have become not only suspect but outrageously misconstrued, like this poor couple um, who was subjected to the English Inquisition um, because they dared to put Christian literature next to the gay leaflets put out at their city hall. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There's a lot of toxic terminology today. In this world war of worldviews, words are weapons. And we've got the snowflakes who are in social justice warriors, SJWs, who are continually screaming about their feelings being hurt and they're being offended, and they're wanting government to restrict the rights of others because they're offensive. And of course, big governments and the big business and big pharma and big tech are very happy to cooperate. Ideas have consequences, which is why they don't want us to have our own ideas. And so the trans-toxic terminology and the work war and world on free speech is getting to the point where you can just see so much censorship and diversity quotes and safe spaces and so on coming to attack those who want to wield the sword of truth. The truth might set you free, but the people want you to stay enslaved. Terminology is not neutral. And do you know the concept of racism? Um, it's a rather annoying communist-inspired silencing tactic, racist. It was Leon Trotsky, or should we say, uh, Levi Moses Bronstein, who is known to us as, Levy, as Leon Trotsky, the founder of the Red Army, who came up with the term racist. And the whole concept of racist is to silence opposition to communism. That if anyone accused you of being a communist or exposed communism, you just accuse them of being an anti-Semitic racist. And so it's a false term. If you go into Webster's Dictionary, you won't find the term racist or racism. It's a 20th century construct, and the communists cooked it up to silence dissent. Terms like hate and bullying and intolerance, misogyny, I mean, there's a whole lot of terms that they are using and they're weaponizing and using it as a stick to beat you over the head with. 
Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they practice deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of accepted opinion, but to allow very lively debate within that spectrum. So you're only allowed to discuss this between these parameters. You can't go and question that and so on and so forth. And there's a book out called Manufacturing Consent, and it's, there's really a lot of media control of what people think. In the past, to suppress dissent, all you had to do was shout heresy. In the church, if you didn't like what a person saying, you accused the person of being a heretic and they kept very quiet because they might get burned at the stake. And if you want to silence political dissent, you accuse the person of treason. And well, a traitor might have his head chopped off or he might be hung or sent to the gulag in the case of the Soviet Union. So that sounds dissent. Today, the modern equivalence of heresy and treason is hate speech. If you want to silence free speech, you accuse a person of hate speech. Or racist, bigot, hater, homophobe. Bigotry, racism, Nazi, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic bigot. All of that's sufficient to silence opposition. It's to prevent free and open discussion. Why would a person want to shut down debate? Pro-choice is not actually pro-choice at all when it comes to education. They talk about being pro-choice when it comes to whether you can kill babies or not. But when it comes to education, well, I prefer to choose a private Christian school or homeschooling. No, you don't have the right for choice. When it came to masquerades, and vaccinations. No, you didn't have the right to choose when it was really your body. Um, but when it comes to killing babies, no, for that we need to be pro-choice. But there won't be pro-choice on whether you want to have a firearm or not, or whether you want to have private schooling or government schooling. For that, uh, they don't like Bible-based parental controlled home education, so it's all a matter of hypocrisy. Most pro-choices tend to oppose conscientious objectors amongst medical staff who choose not to use the healing skills to participate in the take of an innocent life through abortion. So if you're pro-choice, will you allow the doctor or nurse to be pro-choice as to whether they participate in this? No. They say the person should be fined, they shouldn't be hired, they shouldn't be graduated if they won't take part in abortions. So where's the pro-choice when it comes to medical conscience objectives? And do you know in America, about as many black children are aborted as are born. The most dangerous place in the world is actually in in the womb of a black woman because uh, literally half of black babies, one and two, are aborted. A true feminist would fight for the rights of pre-born women, and that's true, because women are actually aborted at a greater rate than men are. There's sex selection abortion, especially in Asia, especially in India, in China. And so if a woman wants to campaign for women's rights, they should actually be against abortion. If abortion is such an acceptable choice, why would Photos of it make pro-choice so angry. Can't you just see the tolerance? Now, an example of newspeak double-think deception in a headline is, Abortion is healthcare. This makes it a human right. This was published in the Daily Maverick back in 2020. Authored by Teleng Moffa King, who's described as the United Nations Commission on Human Rights Special Rapporteur for Physical and Mental Health, whatever that is, the Daily Maverick identifies the article as first published in Section 27's Abortion in Eastern and Southern Africa publication. Now, just as in George Orwell's dystopian 1984 novel, the Ministry of Truth deals in lies, disinformation, and propaganda. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. The Ministry of Peace wages the war. The Ministry of Love engages in torture. And the Ministry of Plenty deals with rationing. It ensures starvation and shortages. As George Orwell said, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder sound respectable. Just think of collateral damage, strategic bombing, executive decision terminated with extreme prejudice. Those are much nicer terms than mass murder. The UN propaganda piece is a classic disinformation and inverted reality. The fact that abortion is recognized as a take of an innocent life throughout almost every country in Africa with the notable exception of ANC rural South Africa. Abortion is only legal in South Africa and Africa. The rest of Africa bans abortion or restricts it significantly. Every abortion stops the beating heart. Abortion is the killing of an innocent human being. Abortion leaves one dead and one wounded. 
one abortion stops, another heart breaks. All women who've had an abortion suffer severe psychological consequences. The medical term is post-abortion stress syndrome, which includes anything from oppression, depression, substance abuse to suicidal thoughts. However, according to the UN propagandist, all states in Africa should legalize abortion, which she describes as reproductive health and a human right. Now, this is an example of cancel culture's twisted, toxic terminology. Evidently unconcerned about the right to life of preborn babies, Muffa King writes of dignity, bodily integrity, equality, safety and security, and health, reproductive justice and freedom to choose. I mean, aren't those nice words for a very ugly thing? And condemns the pro life legislation which outlaws abortion through almost every country in Africa as oppression and discrimination, legalized discrimination, oppression of women, and singles out Malawi and Botswana and Namibia for laws that seek to punish those who work in abortion services. Imagine they punish people who kill babies against the law. How shocking is that? Africa does not welcome abortion. This is demonstrations in Kenya. For mudding the waters, poisoning the well, and weaponizing words, using toxic terminology, all of this is pretty hard to beat. Muffa King complains about the disconnection of abortion from primary health and sexual and reproductive rights, which she condemns as systemic anti-choice positions. I mean, what a lot of inverted reality. Then, on, ominously, this UN propagandist Muffa King complains about South Africa's choice on termination of Pregnancy Act 1996, where she alleges... Many women in the country are denied access to abortion services on the grounds of moral and religious beliefs and those of health providers. In other words, some people don't want to participate in killing their patients. There are only a few practitioners in public health facilities which provide abortion services in South Africa. So evidently, Muffa King and the UN who finance her do not tolerate conscientious objectors on moral and religious grounds. And they want to criminalize those doctors, nurses, and other health professionals like pharmaceuticals who do not want to pervert the healing profession by taking innocent lives through the violence of abortion. This article is an ominous warning of a new concerted attempt to not only stigmatize those countries that seek to protect the most innocent life of all from the violence and injustice of abortion, but to criminalize Christian and other pro-life doctors, nurses, and health professionals from their right to choose to be conscientious objectors in such a highly controversial matter as abortion. Abortion is not health care. Real health care actually saves lives. It's absolutely vital that we speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. But cancel culture wants to cancel your right to object to this pro-death culture. We are to have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but we rather to expose them. Abortion is murder. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will make a stand for me against the workers of iniquity? The Lord hates hands that shed innocent blood. Abortion is a national sin. We cannot expect God to bless a country that destroys its children. Abortion is a national sin. Abortion does not make you unpregnant. Abortion just makes you the mother of a dead baby. Here we are outside the Supreme Court in, in or High Court in Cape Town. Abortion is murder. Uh, on the main road down here, making a stand with our trailer at the foot of Jamison Hall, up at University of Cape Town. And life chains regularly make a stand that abortion kills babies and life begins at conception. By distributing pro-life literature to traffic lights, uh, to passing pedestrians and uh, motorists with banners on the bridges, we're able to make a stand and to let people know that life is sacred and abortion is the ultimate child abuse. We should choose life. We've also noticed many who proclaim themselves to be pro-choice declaring my body my choice, did not believe in choice when it came to mandatory wearing of masks. And those who normally support freedom to protest when it involved Black Lives Matter or Antifa, rioters looting shops and burning buildings, throwing rocks and Molotov cocktail petrol bombs at police, those same people opposed the rights of the hospitality industry to peacefully protest against unconstitutional lockdowns or the rights of citizens to protest against draconian lockdown regulations in the name of combating a virus. And so we are witnessing an unprecedented war against freedom of speech and freedom of movement, freedom of thought, freedom of the press, especially during the lockdown lunacy, the salvation by vaccination COVID cult. 
Many of those who claim to be for freedom of speech oppose freedom of speech on college campuses or on social media when it comes to pro-life or pro-family or pro-marriage or creation science or those who are against unconstitutional lockdown regulations or any other politically incorrect position. And you've probably had the experience where you're trying to argue in terms of facts and research and the other person just shouting a whole lot of slogans at you. Many liberals who claim to be tolerant strenuously oppose any tolerance for pro-lifers or home educators or those who oppose mandatory vaccinations. And those of us who refused mandatory mask wearing and were convinced that lockdown regulations were unconstitutional and unnecessary. Anyone who had a different video view to that of the radical liberal left, we were shouted down. As Plato wrote, strange times are these in which we live when old and young are taught falsehoods in school and the person that dares to tell the truth is called at once a lunatic and a fool. If you have been called crazy and a fool, yeah, uh, well, Plato saw this even 2,400 years ago. So, As Aristotle said, tolerance and apathy are the last virtues of a dying society. We do have a dying society when you can see about the only virtues left are tolerance and apathy towards evil. Societies are far gone in depravity when tolerance is considered a good in itself without regard to the thing tolerated. I was taught to be intolerant as a group. You should be intolerant of dirt and disease and danger and fire hazards. and There's a lot of things you were meant to discriminate against. They used to speak about a person who's discriminating in a positive sense. A discriminating person is a person who had common sense and discernment and distinguished between good, bad, better, best, and so on. But today, you're not meant to be discerning about anything. He who dares not offend cannot be honest. We're continually told not to be offensive, but to not be offensive, you must not be truthful. Because the truth does offend a lot of people. Hate speech is truth that uh, we, the left hates to hear. George Orwell said, journalism is printing what someone else does not want printed. Anything else is public relations or propaganda. There are those who support the hate speech bill, which does not even attempt to deal with genuine hate speech in Antifa or BLM or LGBTQ or among communist revolutionaries or radical Islamic jihadists. That would be real hate speech, but they ignore that. Exterminate those who slander Islam, that's not hate speech. Behead those who insult Islam, no, that's not hate speech. What is hate speech? People quoting the Bible can be hate speech. In the name of combating hate speech, most of these liberal left radicals seek to suffocate free speech of Christians to question or oppose the politically correct radical revolutionary agenda. Their goal is to corrupt and conquer. The most to racist people of all are the ones crying racist all the time. To many today, non-racism means promoting race politics, race quotas and race hatred. It turns out those screaming racist the loudest are the worst racists of all. It's just like these schools who say drug-free zone, and then they've got their kids lining up to get their ritual in the morning. You know, how can it be a drug-free zone when you're drugging your kids on a daily basis? How can this be non-racial when you're just talking about racial quotas and shouting out racial slurs all the time. Or these men in dresses beating up women's rights activists like Kelly J. Keane in New Zealand and then saying there's no place in New Zealand for hate and intolerance. Well, where do they think the hate and intolerance was coming from? Just their crowd. They're the ones who are attacking the, wom the women's rights people and not allowing them to speak under the Let Women Speak banner. And so isn't it incredible uh, hypocrisy out there? Black Lives Matter is not true to its own slogan. Black lives do not matter, do not seem to think that black lives matter in Sudan. They don't think black lives matter in the Congo. They don't think black lives matter in Zimbabwe. They don't think black lives matter in Nigeria or in Chicago gang violence. They do not think that black lives matter in the womb because BLM supports abortion. In fact, BLM went out of their way to support Kemet Gosnell, America's worst serial killer, who killed vast amounts of people through abortion and not just abortion, through infanticide. He's a late-term abortionist, one of only three in the whole of America. But he was not that good a surgeon, so he would let the babies be born, and then he would strangle them or cut their, with scissors, cut their spinal cord after birth. So they were born and then killed them, which made it a, a, a crime by American law. And so he got prosecuted for murder. And 
America's biggest um, serial killer. There's a film out called Gosnell, well worth seeing, even if it's not a very pleasant subject matter, but at least it exposes what happened. And the amounts of people like BLM who came out in support of this mass murdering serial killer. So apparently, most black lives do not matter to BLM. BLM stands for Burn, Loot, and Murder, or should we say, Baal, Lucifer, and Moloch. George Orwell's dystopian novel 1984 now seems ominously prophetic. First published in 1949, George Orwell's 1984 envisaged a future with omnipresent government surveillance and public manipulation through the mass media, the cult of worshipping the party leader, historic revisionism that continually rewriting history, intimidation and social engineering. All of this no longer looks like a joke. In George Orwell's 1984 novel, he wanted to warn of the coming newspeak when words are hijacked to further the totalitarian agenda of revolutionaries. Orwell predicted thought crimes punished by thought police. And when I first read this at school in Rhodesia, where it was a text book, I thought, you know, it's funny, but it could never happen, surely. I mean, how could thoughts ever be a crime? Certainly not in our country. Those who question the newspeak of Big Brother are guilty of thought crimes and will be prosecuted by the thought police. If thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. The Ministry of Peace ensured perpetual war. The Ministry of Truth used lies and propaganda to distort all information in news, entertainment, education, and the arts. The people believe what the media tells them they believe. The Ministry of Truth, or Mini Truth, would vaporize or expunge from public record opponents of the state. If they couldn't debate or argue against them, then they would just have them unpersoned or they'd disappear down the memory hole. Unpersoned. That sort of sounds like deplatforming someone today. The Ministry of Plenty controlled rationing and ensured starvation. The Ministry of Love tortured, terrified, and crushed all dissent and resistance. Many love. The Ministry of Love would also orchestrate the two minutes hate and hate week campaigns to distract and channel anger and frustration of masses towards a real or an imagined enemy. And I think we've seen this up at, on the hill when they had the roads must fall. That was like a hate week. And then sometimes they'd have a two minute hate against some specific uh, direction. So hate, weak, and a uh, mini hate. War is peace. Ignorance is strength. Slavery is freedom. The most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. If you can take away people's history, that's why cancel culture destroys monuments, renames buildings, rewrites history books, brainwashes kids in school. Because those who control the past control the future. Those who control the present control the past. What they mean is, if you can rename the buildings, you can rewrite the textbooks, you can revise the history, create new films, lift up new idols... Um, you can actually, by controlling the present, control the past by rewriting the history and then making a future where people will uh, actually, uh, in the future, worship you. I mean, just think of, for example, in America, uh, they've made an idol of, of Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln was an infidel. He was the first person in the White House who was never baptized and didn't attend church. He was not a believer. And yet he managed to become president of a Christian country. And President Lincoln was actually something of a Marxist. He was a friend of Karl Marx. He wrote correspondence with Karl Marx. Karl Marx liked him. In fact, to this day, uh, communist Cuba has Abraham Lincoln boulevards and Abraham Lincoln high schools and so on. And the Communist Party of the United States has Abraham Lincoln as a patron saint. His picture is bigger than even that of Marx and of Lenin. And uh, Lincoln arrested Supreme Court justice and imprisoned just about the entire legislature of Maryland uh, so that they couldn't secede. And when uh, journalists disagreed with him, had them locked up, he didn't care about habeas corpus. The man is actually a totalitarian thug. But they've made such a hero of Lincoln that you'd say he's one of the greatest men, one of the most wonderful Christians in history. So uh, you go to the Lincoln Memorial today, and it states, in this temple, as in the hearts of a people, um, is enshrined forever the memory of Abraham Lincoln, who saved the Union, I mean saved, eternal, uh, everlasting um, temple in the hearts of people. I mean, this is all religious terminology. And it is an obscene uh, monument to an evil man 
And yet the average kid in America is brought up to think of Abraham Lincoln as one of the greatest people ever, as South Africans are brought up to think of Nelson Mandela or people in the Soviet Union about um, Vladimir Lenin or Mao Zedong in China. In fact, there might be more criticism of Mao in China than there is of Lincoln in America. But uh, you've got many countries that have made an idol. In Britain, it's Winston Churchill. And they distort the history and create a t totally false fictional picture of this idol that gets lifted up uh, and they enter the pantheon of the gods of this country. Just like Rome had their idols, uh, so the modern world has too. Karl Marx declared the first battlefield is a rewriting of history. You see why they need cancel culture? They've got to rewrite history. Every record's been destroyed or falsified. Every book rewritten. Every picture's been repainted. Every statue and street building's been renamed. Every date has been altered. The process is continuing day by day, minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. Everything faded into myths. The past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. That is cancel culture. Enemies of the revolutionary state will be vaporized. They become unpersons and disappear down a memory hole, deleted, deplatformed by big tech social media platform censors. If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. And unfortunately, cancel culture is totally intolerant. The further society drifts on the truth, the more it will hate those who speak the truth. Truth is hate to those who hate the truth. Have you noticed how Marxists call their violent riots protest? I mean, this is an example of newspeak double think terminology. They call the murder of babies choice. Pro choice is a lie, babies don't choose to die. They call perversion an alternative lifestyle. It's more like a death style, actually. They call their hate speech politically correct. They call their racism diversity. They call their intolerance tolerance. They call their violence peace. They call their looting of flat screen TVs a protest. They label your free speech hate speech and a thought crime. We condemn freedom of speech that hurts other people's feelings. That's what the hate speech bill is all about. The only slavery that seems to matter the radical left is a slavery that ended two centuries ago. Opposing slavery today, such as in Red China or Mauritania or Saudi Arabia, for example, is considered irrelevant. It's not worthy of any attention. Cancel culture doesn't want you to understand the present, let alone the past. Yes, there is slavery in the world today. In the Muslim Middle East, the BLM co-founder was convicted of human trafficking, which is the modern word of slavery. So... Ferguson BLM leader Charles Wade was arrested in 2016 for seven counts of human trafficking, including of underage girls. So worse than a slave trader, he is trafficking in little girls for a sex trade. So how's that for hypocrisy? Condemn the slavery that ended two centuries ago while participating in slavery today. If you try to call attention to the desperate plight of black Zimbabweans suffering under a brutal Marxist dictatorship, you'll be accused of being a racist. If you try to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, pre-born babies, if you try to advocate the right to life of pre-born babies, you'll be accused of being anti-choice. Pro-choice is a lie. Babies do not choose to die. You do not have the right to choose anything that the left disapproves of, such as the ultimate child abuse abortion. My body, my choice is what they shout, but if you choose not to wear a mandatory mask, you may be accused of being guilty of a hate crime. Apparently, when it really is your body, you don't have a choice at all. Anyone who disagrees with radical revolutionary rhetoric may be accused of being a far-right extremist. Those making such judgmental generalizations may be far-left radical extremists attempting to silence dissent by shouting incendiary slogans. All whites are racist is not normally recognized as the racist generalization it obviously is, nor even as judgmental, but of course it is judgmental. This is what Black Lives Matter really means. White people are recessive genetic defects and subhuman. Black people can literally wipe out the white race if we had the power to, says the co-founder of BLM. BBBEE, -E, racial quotas in workplace and sports, is not often publicly recognized as racial discrimination, but it is. Nothing is their fault. Any criticism of their violent, intolerant racism is dismissed as racism. The radical left is no longer willing to discuss or debate the merits of a case using facts and not logic. They generally choose to shout insults and ad hominem invectives in an aggressive attempt to stifle debate and silence any alternative viewpoint. Everything is your fault. Any attempt to respond to these generalizations and condemnations will be dismissed as racist or judgmental. Like spoiled brats, 
These radicals resort to temper tantrum tactics to intimidate and bully others into compliance to the ever increasingly irrational demands. They are the cry bullies, the snowflakes. They want their safe spaces, and you must give in to their uh, demands. As such as you can see what was left in the wake of BLM. Liberals preach the gospel of victimization. I'm a victim, you are to blame, and nothing is my fault. The previously disadvantaged refers to those who received subsidized housing, free medical care, and free education. The previously advantaged refers to those of us who are overtaxed to pay for the free medical care, free education, and subsidized housing for millions of migrants pouring into their country from free liberated countries for opportunities, freedoms, and benefits they couldn't enjoy in liberated countries. So white privilege refers to those of us who were caned at school, conscripted into the army to protect black tribes from being terrorized by freedom fighters, and taxed to aid the people we were accused of oppressing. That's white privilege. Yeah, that's the white privilege I've got. Sit ups with rock BT and uh, being caned at school and beaten in the army and have people try to kill you. Communists seem to be inoculated against logic. Hence, we're living in the most intolerant age with the worst racism ever seen in history, when hate speech is most propagated by those who claim to be against hate speech, where free speech is at risk by those who claim to be for freedom. This is cancel culture at work. If I say all lives matter, then I'm condemned as a racist. If an American stands for his country's flag and national anthem, he has to apologize. You're allowed to go to church. You're not allowed to go to church and worship but you can't burn down a church as a protest. You cannot open your own business, but you can loot and destroy other people's businesses. The police in America are condemned as racist pigs, but Antifa and BLM mobs can destroy cities because they are protesters. You cannot protest oppressive COVID-19 lockdown regulations, but you can riot against racism when you want. You may not play with friends and family at the park, but you can destroy the park. You are not allowed to protect your monuments and your history, but you can graffiti vandalize and pull down national monuments. You're not allowed to have an opinion on these issues, and if you express an opinion other than the mandated mantras of the politically correct crowd, then you're a racist bigot, guilty of hate crimes, and you deserve abuse. You're getting to understand cancel culture and the woke world war? In America, you can write with the Black Lives Matter, but if you go to a Trump rally, COVID-19 could magically reappear and be a threat to public health. Communism is a mind virus the most destructive force in history. Identity politics, which seek to define people as a group and pits groups against one another, aims at complete state ownership of your life, where state power even supersedes the church. They aim to confuse you, divide you, and conquer you. For centuries, it's been recognized that freedom of worship, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of opinion, freedom of thought, freedom of the press, freedom of movement, free enterprise, that all these are absolutely essential for freedom. It is a testament to the insidious success of cultural Marxism that all of these essential foundations for Western civilization are under attack, relentless attack today. And those attempts to expose the inevitable consequence of these destructive tendencies are shouted down, censored, deleted from many internet platforms, especially Zuckerberg's thought police. We need to recognize how revolutions work, and cancel culture and toxic terminology is one of their tactics. Reading or remembering George Orwell's ominous warnings at Animal Farm in 1984 and the writings of Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago or Otto Scott's Robespierre inside the French Revolution, these will go a long way to helping us to recognize and understand the tactics of guilt manipulation, indoctrination, gaslighting, and the Stockholm Syndrome, how they intimidate, bully, and manipulate the masses to destroy what centuries of Christian sacrifice have so painstakingly built up. Do you know that there are today... Ten librarians in prison concentration camps in Cuba for the crime of distributing animal farm. For 25 years sentences, ten of them. Animal farm, that was enough to get you a 25 year sentence in a concentration camp in Cuba. Librarians. Counter-revolutionary reactionaries, that's what they are. The word of God commands us, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give it a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldiers proved. Nearly 500 years ago, Professor Martin Luther declared, If I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God's word, except precisely that point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, that I'm not confessing Christ, however boldly I might be professing him. 
Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldiers proved. And to be steady on all the battlefront besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. And this is the point. We are in a battle and we need to be alert uh, any time uh, these transgender cancel culture characters are coming with a woke agenda. God created the male and female. Transgender ideology is a war against the family. And we need to be with what the scriptures say and keep men out of women's sports. Some people who make a stand like... Um, uh, Riley Gaines here, uh, she made a stand after being unfairly deprived of the trophy that she had worked hard for by a man, uh, Leah Thomas, transgender character, claimed to be a woman, um, competing in women's sports. This is cheating. Uh, nobody should uh, tolerate this. And uh, They must stop discriminating against female athletes, our bodies, our sports. Now this is what you've got to do, to swim against the current. And uh, these people who make a stand are being now assaulted. Our universities can be wide gates to hell. Professor Martin Luther warned, I'm afraid that schools may prove to be wide gates to hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures, engraving them in the hearts of youth. I advise no one to place this child where the Scriptures do not reign paramount.